Let's go on to the 17 because they are a bit in, uh, interrelated. Okay. And discussion topic number 17, how do you understand Dhamma Vichaya as, uh, as an awakening factor? What do you mean by investigating the Dhamma? How? What Dhamma do you investigate? Okay. What Dhamma do you investigate? You know, and how do you investigate the Dhamma in order for it to qualify as an awakening factor? Okay. <coughs> so I hope these uh, two questions are clear enough. So please form your groups and start your discussion. From our discussion and also some of my opinion, um, when the uh, awakening factor of Dharma which Jaya has reached is heightened level, a person would not lose the chance of investigating anything around him or her. The uh, the investigating. Uh, uh, the Dhamma Vijaya will continue investigating either in terms of cause and condition, cause and effect, and it also will take an, uh, Anicca, Dukkha, and Anatta as uh, as an investigating, uh, investigating criteria. Criteria. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we, we, that, that includes uh, conceptual truth as well, or does it only include uh, Paramatta Dhamma, ultimate reality? It can be both. Can be both. Yes, yes, can be both. That is when uh, Dhamma Vichaya has reached its peak. How yes. about the low end Dhamma Vichaya? <laughs> low end. How uh, do you start? How do you start to get to the to the to the peak? Low end is slower pace. Uh. <laughs> uh, what does that mean? Slower pace. Uh, meaning you you you. You start with like six sense base. Uh. You look at the eye, eye object and uh, the, the, the contact. Then you try to understand the conditionality. Slowly, when it matures, then it will gain its peak. Uh. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, anyone else like to contribute? No? Okay, then let's turn to page uh, 98. Yeah, answers to both these questions are partially there. Page 98, Virtue Discourse. Monks, those monks who are accomplished in virtue, accomplished in composure, that means in samadhi, accomplished in knowledge, accomplished in liberation, accomplished in the knowledge and vision of liberation. Monks, even the sight of those monks is helpful, I say. Even listening to them, even approaching them, even attending on them, even recollecting them, monks, even going forth after them is helpful, I say. For what reason? Because monks, having heard the Dhamma from such monks, one dwells withdrawn by way of two kinds of withdrawal, withdrawal of body and withdrawal of mind. Dwelling thus withdrawn, one recollects that Dhamma and thinks it over. Whenever monks, a monk dwelling thus withdrawn, recollects the Dhamma and thinks it over, on that occasion the mindfulness awakening factor of the monk is aroused. On that occasion the monk develops the mindfulness awakening factor. On that occasion the mindfulness awakening factor of the monk comes to fulfillment by development. Dwelling thus mindfully, he discriminates that Dhamma with wisdom, examines it and makes an investigation of it. Whenever monks, a monk dwelling thus withdrawn, discriminates that Dhamma with wisdom, examines it, makes an investigation of it, on that occasion, the investigation of Dhamma awakening factor of the monk is aroused. On that occasion, the monk develops the investigation of Dhamma awakening factor. On that occasion, the investigation of Dhamma awakening factor of the monk comes to fulfillment by development, etc., etc. So it goes on to the next one. You know? From here it goes on to the next one, which is virya, which is energy and so forth, until uh, samadhi and upeka, uh, equanimity. So you see that uh, sati as an awakening factor need not necessarily uh, pertain only to satipatthana. You know, like some of you uh, maintain, nor does it need to be something experiential. Yeah, it starts from something very basic. Maybe this is a low-end sati, you know, remembering the instructions, 
you know, like uh, Sister uh, Joan just said just now, uh, that remembering the instructions so that you can examine it, uh, investigate it, and to see how to put it into practice. Right? That is also investigation of the Dhamma. Right? But these are only two aspects, you know. There are actually many other ways that sati can be reckoned as an awakening factor. Now, let's look at uh, the Bodhjanga Sangyutta. Uh, that's in the um, Sangyutta Nikaya. What we read just now also was from the, is also from the Sangyutta, uh, Bodhjanga Sangyutta, but there are more suttas uh, from that Sangyutta that talks about many ways in which uh, the seven awakening factors can be aroused and put to use, not confined to just the Sadipatthanas. Yeah, because a lot of people, especially Satipatthana yogis, think that this is the only right sati, sa, right, uh, sati, <laughs> right uh, awakening factor and others are wrong. So I want you to, you know, uh, open up your minds and be more humble. Okay, let's go on. To mindfulness, this one is what we just said just now. I'm just going very quickly over this. Okay, this one is another one. It says, whenever mindfulness there is of things internal, of things external, that is also the awakening factor of mindfulness. This one sounds more like the Satipatthana sort of mindfulness. You know, you are remembering your breath internally, you are remembering, you know, things externally, uh, and uh, looking at them in terms of maybe, and not, not really in terms of Anicca Dukkanata, that will be the aspect of Dhamma Vichaya already, right? Uh, looking back at what had just happened. Investigation of Dhamma is whenever a monk... Okay, this is what we just uh, read just now. Same. And this is an extension of the second sutta. Whenever one discriminates Dhammas internally or externally with wisdom, examines them, makes an investigation of them, that is the awakening factor of investigation of states. Now, I want to remind you that sati and panya, or investigation, are two different things. Some people tend to uh, mix them together. You know, I mean, it's okay as a practitioner for you to mix them up together, but if, uh, in terms of very uh, technical terms, you know, they are separate uh, phenomena. In a sense that, um, to give a simile, it's just like an organization, you are working for a corporation. Then you have the executive, uh, you have the board of directors, you have the uh, executive uh, managers, and then you have uh, different departments. You have the HR department, the PR department, the account department, the admin department, marketing department, and so forth, right? Each of them has its own function. But all of them has to function harmoniously in order for the cooperation to be successful. Right or not? So it's the same thing. You know, the chitta is composed of many different mental factors and each of them has its own job to do. And the job of sati is very specialized. The job of sati is just to bring a past object to the attention of the mind. All right? The past object could be a Dhamma talk you heard before, some principles, some instructions. The past object could be a past life. You know? The past object could be an immediate past object. Well, it just happened at any of the six sense doors. It brings it to the attention of the mind. And then once it has done its job, finish. Now who takes over? You know, Panya takes over. Investigation. Now it's the job of Dhamma Vijaya to take over, to investigate the object that has come into its presence. Alright? <clears throat> so that's why um, Tadao Dejaniya wrote this book called Awareness is Not Enough. You know, you're not just barely aware, 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 you know. If you're aware without investigation, it doesn't give you Panya. Right? And then sati is not just bare awareness. That's, that's a very, very unfair uh, and inadequate uh, translation for sati. Because sati brings with it a lot of background knowledge. Yeah? A lot of background information. Sati is the one that, that gives the investigation of Dhamma department you know, some uh, encoding. Yeah? Uh, some programming, you know, even though they process information, they must have some software to process it. You know, this software is supplied by Sati. 
Sati is the one that has heard the Dhamma talk, right? And Sanya preserves it in the memory. Alright, Sati is the one that willfully, intentionally tries to remember, recall. And then when you do it again and again and again, it gets embedded into Sanya. Alright? So Sanya, it is Sati, Sanya and Panya are very, very closely interrelated. That's why I said earlier in Puttapada Sutta, the Buddha said, Sanya arises first, followed by Jnana, knowledge. So, uh, the job of Sati is to bring the object, past object, whether it's a distant past or immediate past, to the mind's attention. Once it's there, Panya takes over to investigate. Yeah? Uh, investigate in terms of the background information that has been gathered by Sati and, pan- and Sanya, yeah? and perception. <clears throat> And then uh, you will try to verify what Sanya has uh, embedded in the consciousness. Sanya says everything is anicca, dukkha, anatta. Then Panya tries to verify, is it true or not? Is it really anicca, dukkha, anatta? Is that cause and condition or not? You know, that is the job of Panya, to verify it in ex- experiential reality. Right? Sanya is just uh, giving information from the past, recording past information. Right? Uh, so that's why uh, if you do not have any Buddhist background knowledge, you're a non-Buddhist, you go and learn meditation, you go to a traditional uh, Buddhist meditation center where they assume that you already know all these things. So for those people who already know all these things, no need to tell them, you know, everything is a nicca, dukkha, anatta. All you need to do is just be aware. Uh, in fact, uh, some Abhidhamikas, they are, they are so uh, analytical, they tend to analyze everything and that sometimes get into the way of true mindfulness and true panya. Instead of panya, it is sanya that is taking over, right? It is not a panya that is verifying experientially, but it is just sanya um, putting on uh, past knowledge onto present experience. <coughs> okay, so uh, bare awareness is not enough. You need to have uh, the backing of uh, Sati sanya, and Sanya, and then you need to put an active element of investigation. You need to question why. But in order to question why, you need to settle your mind first. If your mind is very, very agitated, how can you ask why? The more you ask, the more agitated you become because you cannot find the answer. So that's why what I taught you just now, the first three steps, that's just to calm your mind. That's not yet going to the next step of asking, you know, that is just to calm your mind, to make it compose, and when your mind is composed, then you can begin to ask questions. And even before you begin to ask questions, you know, when your mind is composed, then you be, can catch the intentions of your mind, you know. Normally people don't catch the intentions, you know, they think what they want to think, they say what they want to say, they do what they want to do, and then think about it later. <laughs> but if you practice this, um, so-called present moment awareness, five sense awareness, continuously or continually throughout the daily life, then you have a reference point. Whenever you, you notice that your mind is not aware of what you're doing in the present moment, you know that it's thinking. Right? The moment you know that think it's thinking, then you can check and see what sort of thought it is, what sort of intention is it. Then you can apply the bar test. Is it beneficial, appropriate, uh, relevant, realistic? And if it's not, then put it away, come back to the present moment. And uh, with practice, you don't just put it away, you can look at it in terms of anicca, dukkha, anatta. It's not me, you know, it came by itself. I didn't go and think this, I will thought, it's not me who commented on the, on, on the roach on the woman's face. You know, it's just a thought that arose due to past conditioning. Uh, then you can see anatta, and when you see anatta in that way, although, you, although, you know, is you could say it's on a superficial level, but still, it accumulates. And, as it accumulates and you uh, um, extend it to as many aspects of your life as possible, then it permeates through your mindset and your attitude will change. Right? So it is sanya, and then one day when the sanya is ripe, then the panya will arise, which is the insight. The you know, insight will arise spontaneously and it's like uh, you know, a big um, turnabout in your perception of the world. <coughs> Okay, let's go on to the next one. Now, this is for all awakening factors. A bhikkhu <laughs> develops the awakening factor of one to seven, right? Sati to the last one, to upeka. 
accompanied by metta, karuna, murita, equanimity, mindfulness of breathing. Based upon seclusion, dispassion, and secession, maturing in release. Okay, so this also is the awakening factor. By doing metta, karuna, murita, equanimity, mindfulness of breathing, also you are developing the awakening factor of sati and so forth, provided you know, your practice is based on seclusion, dispassion, and secession, maturing in release, which means that it is geared towards uh, liberation. If you are just doing it without uh, uh, taking a further step to vipassana meditation, then it may not be the awakening factor. It's the same for various forms of asuba, perception of a skeleton, of a worm-infested corpse, of a livid corpse, of a fissured corpse, of a bloated corpse. Uh, when you develop the awakening factor accompanied by these perceptions, uh, based on seclusion, dispassion and secession, maturing and release, that is also uh, qualified as an awakening factor. Right? Then, if you, if you develop sati, etc., until upeka, accompanied by the perception of impermanence of suffering in the impermanence of non-self in what is suffering, based upon seclusion, dispassion and secession, maturing in release, this will also qualify as the awakening factor. Right? Now, uh, the <coughs> let's look at modern scientists, particularly quantum physicists. Now, quantum physicists nowadays, uh, they're all very... Uh, they, they, they all share this consensus that everything is void. Everything is empty. You know, they, in the old days, we think that the atom is the smallest unit of ma uh, particle of matter. But now they say that that's not so. You know, can you can imagine that an atom is like a football field, and then the nucleus is like a football. You know, <laughs> and then the uh, uh, what do you call the, the neutrons and electrons are moving around, are even smaller than uh, little pins, you know, moving around in that vast space of emptiness. Yeah? So actually, they agree with the, uh, the, the Buddhist teaching of emptiness. Actually, everything is empty. There's nothing there. And nothing is permanent because no scientist has ever seen with your naked eye or with your mind's eye an atom or an electron or subatomic particle. They are all concepts that they have derived from formulas, you know, calculations. Uh, they have not directly seen them, they cannot see them. And uh, although they know all these things, theoretically, they are not awakened. <laughs> uh, they are not awakened because they don't have the experiential knowledge of seeing and experiencing arising and passing away due to causes and conditions. They know theoretically, but they have no experiential, experiential understanding. Right, <clears throat> that's why. And some of the, when I was in uh, Kota Kinabalu, there was one retired professor of uh, physics, uh, and uh, he had been joining the Dharma classes for some time, but he was actually from the Catholic background. He was lecturing in Singapore for many years, and now he's retired. He settled down in KK. And he had a hard time trying to understand you know, the principles of Buddhism until somebody lent him uh, the Heart Sutra. You know, when he read the Heart Sutra, and then immediately he said, oh yeah, now I can, I can, uh, you know, <laughs> I can jive with it. it. It makes sense to me. It makes perfect sense to me. Because it's all talking about emptiness. You know? uh, and he, he wrote an article you know, about uh, how, how to uh, uh, reconcile or how to um, compare, how he compared modern quantum physics the, the, the findings of modern quantum physics to this idea about impermanence and uh, not-self and emptiness. And he, he wrote at the end of his article, it's, one, it's a wonder how the Buddha knew all this two, more than 2,500 years ago without the sophisticated instruments that we have. Actually, what we have now is very primitive compared to the mind. Isn't it? You know, the, the, the best and the most sophisticated computer you have in the world cannot be compared to your brain <laughs> and the system that is operating in our body. Yeah. Right. Uh, <clears throat> so all these things uh, is not just theoretical knowledge. Although theoretical knowledge is important, you still have to apply that to experiential understanding. Okay? 
Okay, let's go on to the next one. Okay, this one is also very obvious. If it develops the awakening factor accompanied by the perception of abandonment of distension of secession based upon seclusion, distension and secession maturing in release, and then that also qualifies. But here it seems that maybe this is a copy and paste job, you know, because it is it, a perception of dispassion is really there, and why should we be based on dispassion? And the session is really there, why should we be based in secession? Right? We don't know. This is something which is more applicable to everyone, and I think it's more inspiring, because it says that when because a noble disciple listens to the Dhamma with eager ears, attending to it as a matter of vital concern, directing his whole mind to it, on that occasion the five hindrances are not present in him. On that occasion, the seven factors of enlightenment go to fulfillment by development. So it's no wonder that people during the Buddha's time got enlightened while they were listening to Dhamma talks, right? Because at that time, your mind has been freed from the five hindrances and the seven factors of enlightenment are being uh, aroused and developed. Okay? So listen to more Dhamma talks more intently. <laughs> Besides meditating, of course. Yeah? Okay, that's all for awakening factors. Do you have any questions before we go on to a summary and conclusion for today's um, session?